So far, we've heard a lot about basic science, so um, what I do is more clinically focused, so um, uh, bear with me. It's good to be wedged between a Weinberg and a Matsuya because uh, it keeps uh, many, many of you in the room. Uh, so we're interested in this idea, as many are, of accelerated aging with HIV disease, and there's several indications that this might be occurring, but the data are not entirely consistent, and they're mostly cross-sectional. Uh, examples using neuropsychological testing include uh, these data all the way back from 2004 from the Hawaii group led by Cecilia Shakuma and Victor Valcor showing in, in a, uh, in a uh, cohort that was focused on evaluating uh, neurocognitive performance in older people that the older group here, older than 50, most of us in this room would agree that that's not very old, um, but that they were more likely to have what we call the symptomatic forms of HAND, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, either mild neurocognitive disorder or what many of us remember from uh, the older days, uh, HIV-associated dementia whereas the younger group was likely, more likely to be, uh, uh, have normal performance or to have this asymptomatic form. We looked at this in San Diego. Uh, uh, I've been in San Diego almost 20 years now, uh, but my mentors have been there for uh, 30, and we uh, have had an NIMH Center Award nearly that entire time. Uh, we have uh, both uh, HIV negative normative populations and uh, HIV positive populations. These data are again cross-sectional. Uh, but you can see there's some decline in the HIV negative uh, populations uh, with age. Around this time is when we start to forget where we left our keys. Uh, but you can see there's modest decline overall. And what we look at in some of these uh, analyses is whether the slopes diverge. You're familiar with this. If there's an offset, that means that there's an HIV effect uh, if the slopes are, are similar. But if the slopes diverge, uh, then that is consistent with but doesn't prove the idea of accelerated aging. And this interaction was statistically significant in this analysis. We've also looked at this <clears throat> using volumetrics, uh, mapping out the volumes of normal gray matter, normal white matter in the brain, abnormal white matter, uh, 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 the size of the deep gray matter. And in this analysis, what we saw, again, with a similar approach, was that uh, people with <coughs> HIV had relatively more abnormal white matter as they aged compared with a HIV negative norm normative population. And in fact, now uh, this finding has been uh, confirmed. Uh, actually, this is the first finding technically because uh, this has not been published yet. But this finding from Ron Cohen's group from Florida and Brown uh, have nicely shown that uh, the HIV negative population in their study did not have increased white matter abnormalities or hyperintensities as they're sometimes called, whereas the HIV po positive population did. And this, again, this interaction was statistically significant. Uh, other people uh, have looked at uh, subcortical gray matter. You'll remember that uh, back in the old days that uh, the deep gray matter was uh, uh, structures, included structures that were particularly targeted by HIV. That may not be as true as it once was, uh, but uh, these data showed that it was not only the volume of the subcortical gray matter that was different in HIV positive people as they aged, but the shape of, of the subcortical gray matter. And that's because some of the structures actually enlarge, and that could be due to edema or actually abnormal sprouting of, uh, of neurons. So we see uh, sometimes, usually back, in, back with HIV dementia, we used to see dendritic loss but uh, sometimes when uh, uh, neurons are recovering from injury, they don't recover normally and they can have abnormal sprouting. So we've seen this also in our methamphetamine data. So we can also use uh, techniques like uh, MR spectroscopy. Uh, this can be done in animals, so some of you may be familiar with this technique from animal data. And uh, this method is able to uh, estimate cerebral metabolites like NAA, which is an indicator of, uh, of neuronal integrity, and uh, myonositol, which is an indicator of gliosis, and uh, creatinine, which is an indicator of metabolic state. And uh, the, uh, the imaging scientists can target different parts of the brain, such as the anterior cingulate cortex, parietal gray matter, and so on. And when Lucette Sassik here looked at this, she found an interaction where HIV progressed more rapidly in the frontal white matter with loss of NAA, reduction in neuronal 
integrity. In this analysis by Linda Chang from Hawaii, they found an HIV effect, uh, but not uh, uh, an interaction. And they stratified it by APOE epsilon 4 status as well. But they also used a more uh, nuanced method of looking at white matter called the uh, diffusion tensor imaging method. And they did see an interaction here using this matter with uh, abnormalities in the white matter in myelin. So th these are just a, a, a smattering of some of the findings. And as I said, not all the data are consistent. So uh, there are data looking at neuropsychological testing that did not see a clear interaction between HIV and age, although some of these may be uh, underpowered. And uh, not all the imaging data are the same either. So this uh, is looking also at uh, deep gray matter, finding an HIV effect, but not an interaction. And also at cerebral blood flow, again, finding an HIV effect, but not an interaction. So the data are not entirely consistent when it comes to the question of whether or not HIV is actually uh, accelerating uh, aging of the brain. Uh, we uh, got funding uh, from NIMH to uh, bring back people in our charter cohort after 12 years and re-examine them re and to see if they actually in the same people with longitudinal data relative to a normative population, whether they were actually aging, appear to be aging more, uh, more rapidly. Uh, to support that, we looked in some of our existing biomarker data for evidence of correlation with age, global deficit score, which is one of the summary measures we use to estimate overall neuropsychological performance, or again, whether there was evidence of an interaction. And what you can see at a glance is that m almost all of the biomarkers we looked at correlated with age, which was uh, uh, surprising even to me. I didn't expect to see this degree of consistency. Uh, it was not as consistent in the other two measures, including the interaction, but what we did see is many of the biomarkers that we classified as aging-related, telomere length, mitochondrial common deletion, mitochondrial DNA, uh, markers of, uh, uh, of end products of oxidative stress, we did see some evidence in, in many of these for an age, age by uh, biomarker interaction. So these are all in HIV-positive adults. So we saw stronger associations in the older adults between neurocognitive performance and the biomarker with HIV DNA, tel telomere length, and others. And so I just thought I'd touch on a couple of these. Here's the HIV DNA. This is a, uh, a marker that's, of course, of interest to all of us uh, because it, it reflects, uh, in part, integrated HIV. And it's been popularized, again, by uh, Bruce Shiramitsu and Cecilia Shakuma and Victor Valcor. Uh, in this case, uh, looking at it in, in th their project in Thailand, showing that people with uh, HIV-associated dementia had uh, much higher levels of HIV DNA, particularly in CD14, CD16 positive uh, lymphocytes, which have been linked to uh, hand as well. Um, uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Routy from McGill provided me this nice slide he showed uh, a couple of years ago at a lecture where he showed that the HIV DNA content or integrated DNA correlated nicely with age. And uh, Michelle Faria de Oliveira and Sarah Janella, using specimens from our cohort, uh, recently published uh, this finding in which they found that the HIV DNA of PBMCs only uh, correlated with worse neuropsychological performance in uh, people who were in uh, who are older than 50, and uh, we can ask why that might be. And one of the reasons is that the older group, of course, had a longer duration of infection as well. But even after accounting for that in uh, multivariable regression, this effect was still there. So. Um, I, I want to talk more about that, but I think in the interest of time, because I've got 20 minutes and a lot of slides, I'll move on and we can come back to that uh, either uh, at the question session or, uh, or later. So I thought I'd show you this too. Uh, we, we have also an HIV and methamphetamine center uh, in San Diego, uh, because uh, while uh, Southern California shared methamphetamine now with the rest of the world, it did uh, start uh, in San Diego and we still have a lot of methamphetamine users. And this is a, uh, a rather poor man's heat map that I made by hand uh, for a recent scientific advisory board in an interim analysis looking at our biomarker data that we generate in my lab. And, um, and looking at the pattern, not only for neurocognitive impairment here, but as you know, that's not the only manifestation of brain injury. So we can also look at uh, Beck depression inventory, an indicator of mood, 
And we also know that people with HIV and also methamphetamine users have particular injury of the frontal systems. And so our neuropsychologists are uh, per per performing something called the, uh, the frontal systems uh, behavioral assessment. And this generates data uh, composite measures assessing apathy, impulsivity, sensation seeking, and HIV transmission behavior. And I put this here, even though these are preliminary data and uh, somewhat tenuous, because you can see at a glance that uh, um, the biomarker patterns are quite different for these different behaviors. So here I've categorized these uh, biomarkers as uh, immune response related, aging, um, vascular, which is a particular interest in our, of ours with, uh, with HIV and with methamphetamine, and then uh, also uh, oxidative stress and neuronal markers. And um, what you can see here is that even the inflammation or immune response biomarkers differ with these different uh, behaviors, and I thought what was particularly notable here was this very unique profile for HIV transmission behavior, which I think is, uh, could be potentially important. So we're certainly going to be looking at this further. With the focus of this talk on aging, I thought I would show you uh, the telomeres, though. Um, so this is showing you uh, the telomere length for this uh, cohort so far, comparing uh, it to age and showing uh, the, uh, the decline with age, a very strong correlation here, uh, both in the HIV negative population and in the HIV uh, positive population. And again, we see an HIV effect, but uh, in this interim analysis, we did not see a clear HIV by age interaction. Now, I don't usually settle for simply looking at biomarkers in a linear way. I also look at them in a categorical way using methods such as uh, recursive partitioning. And using that, what you can see is that there is a difference uh, here uh, between the HIV negative and HIV positive people in the mid-age range. And we can't really stratify these uh, older and younger groups very well because they're small. So it may be that uh, as we complete our, our cohort and our analyses, that the, there will also be an HIV effect here. But there does seem to be perhaps an interaction at least between the ages of 28 and 54. Now, I thought I'd just also tell you while, while we were on the topic of telomeres that there are some sparse published data indicating that uh, P24 uh, can actually increase in cell culture telomerase activity. And that might make sense because uh, HIV would want the cell to survive, would not want it to have mutations in the, uh, in the nuclear chromosomes that would lead to death of the cell. So it may uh, tend to increase the cap, the telomere cap, on, on, uh, uh, on the chromosomes of the cell it infects. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that telomerase is a reverse transcriptase. And so there's actually also data that reverse transcriptase inhibitors uh, can inhibit, nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitors can inhibit uh, telomerase. And in this analysis, the most potent uh, uh, inhibitor of telomerase was tenofovir. So it would be more convenient if it was the older nucleoside analogs like didanosine or DDC, but unfortunately in this analysis, which needs confirmation, but in this analysis it was tenofovir. Now older uh, indicators, uh, biomarkers of aging have come under some criticism uh, because uh, uh, what do they relate to? They do seem to be uh, consistent with uh, risk for cancer, but do they really have any biological significance for something like dementia? And that's still unknown. But Steve Horvath and Andy Levine at UCLA have been working using the Illumina DNA methylation array to develop a method, an algorithm known as that they've called the biological clock. And they argue is a more accurate indicator of, of biological aging than uh, the telomere length or, of course, chronological age. And so they've looked at both uh, blood cells, again here finding an HIV uh, um, uh, effect for, uh, uh, for uh, earlier aging uh, uh, without uh, an HIV by age interaction in blood cells, uh, PBMCs. But here in brain tissue, they actually did find evidence for more rapid uh, aging of brain tissue than in HIV negative people. So moving on, we've also looked at CMV briefly. We have many others, so this is an area of strong interest because uh, uh, nearly all people with HIV are infected with CMV. It has a, a number of effects, including uh, potentially driving uh, uh, differentiation of naive T cells, 
to lead to earlier immune senescence. And so that's of interest to us. And uh, we've just very coarsely working with Nell Lorraine at Rush and Alan Landy uh, measured anti-CMV IgG and CMV DNA and found uh, some associations uh, with uh, neurocognitive performance and interestingly, particularly in people on suppressive antiretroviral therapy, whether we look at this uh, continuously with global T-scores or by uh, the binary neurocognitive impairment measure. So what this shows is that the only difference here between impaired and unimpaired people is in people who are on suppressive antiretroviral therapy. If you're on failing therapy or you're on no therapy, there's no difference. So <clears throat> for unsuccessful CNS aging, there's a number of factors to think about when we're thinking about uh, managing, because that's the, supposed to be the focus of this talk, managing <clears throat> um, accelerated aging uh, in the brain in people with HIV. So there's HIV-related factors we have to consider. There's host-related factors. Uh, there's other organism-related. I mentioned CMV. I took out my slides about the gut microbiome because this is a bit long anyway, but this is an area of strong interest for us and many others, and we already see some uh, signal here for relationship between the, uh, uh, the gut microbiome composition and uh, cognitive performance. And then also drug-related, not only ART toxicity, stimulant and opiate use, but also polypharmacy and drug-drug interactions. And there's a number of mediators. And this is a very simplistic, you know, sort of uh, idea model, con conceptual model. So uh, we could go into much more detail about this, but these are a few factors that have been implicated. So when we think about managing hand in aging HIV-positive adults, uh, we want to focus on some of the same things we focus on in all patients, earlier initiation of, initiation of ART, a uh, number of end organ complications, including hand, have been linked to uh, the Nader CD4 count. So the earlier we start therapy, probably the better for preventing uh, cognitive problems. We know our patients have mood disorders, sleep disorders, substance use disorders, and so we need to treat those first. And then we know we, we also get this vascular metabolic risk and disease. I took these slides out, but there's nice studies linking vascular disease and insulin resistance to cognitive problems as well. And what that means, unfortunately for us, is we need to exercise regularly, uh, healthy diet, smoking cessation, and treat uh, dyslipidemia and insulin resistance, things that we would do already. What is uh, still something to be proven is whether treating co-infections is important. And certainly these days we would treat HCV, we would treat, of course, syphilis, but a big question for us is what do we do with CMV? And that's an area moving forward that is quite interesting. I, I haven't uh, listed here either that we found evidence for latent toxoplasmosis. We tend to accept you know, that uh, people are infected with toxo, that they have toxo cysts in their brain. We just let them live with that. But in fact, we see evidence, again, for cognitive problems in people with even latent toxo. What we need are sterilizing drugs to treat toxo. So we also want to uh, limit polypharmacy and drug-drug interactions. And uh, the role of other in interventions is unclear. Anti-inflammatories, neurotrophins and growth factors, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and NMDA receptor antagonists, probiotics, and so on, uh, more work needs to be done. Now, again, for all of us, uh, uh, there are emerging and strengthening data that exercise is important. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll simply say this is looking at oxygen consumption during exercise and showing that in uh, normal people, normal people are more likely, uh, or unimpaired people are more likely to have higher oxygen consumption uh, consistent with uh, peak oxygen consumption, consi consistent with being in better shape, whereas people with MND or HAD are more likely to have lower oxygen consumption. Uh, we actually performed an analysis, uh, or my colleagues did in San Diego, uh, just asking people about their exercise within the last 72 hours and finding that people who reported exercising within the last 72 hours had a rather uh, substantially uh, less likely uh, were substantially less likely to, uh, to be impaired. So I don't think I need to uh, go on about smoking cessation. This is a study just looking at cardiovascular events and showing in a nice stair-step way uh, not only that uh, stopping smoking uh, benefited <coughs> cardiovascular events, but that it, it, uh, the risk declined the longer someone was from smoking cessation. We also performed a, uh, a clinical trial in China with NIH funding 
comparing the first-line regimens uh, in China at that time, nevirapine, azidovidine 3TC, and afavirin's uh, uh, tenofovir uh, FTC, or 3TC also. And what we saw uh, was greater decline in the afavirin's uh, group uh, at 96 weeks. Whether we looked at this using this uh, continuous measure or uh, just progression to impairment. So this was a prevention study. Everyone was unimpaired to start with. And when we started this, we designed this because these two regimens uh, differed substantially in the CNS penetration effectiveness, or CPE scores. But while we were doing the study, uh, more and more evidence emerged about the long-term neurotoxicity of efavirenz. And in fact, when we looked in a nested case control uh, sub-study, uh, we found that uh, people who declined at uh, 48 weeks had higher CSF to plasma ratios of efavirenz, but we also found that they had lower CSF to plasma ratios of tenofovir. So there was evidence potentially of toxicity, but also of potential ineffectiveness in the brain as well. So uh, this, this could be due to the increasing, the toxicity of antiretrovirals could increase with age because we know that blood-brain barrier permeability increases with age, here indexed as the CSF to serum albumin ratio. And we see this when we look at our uh, favorins, for example, uh, uh, pharmacology data showing uh, with age a modest increase uh, in plasma, but a more substantial increase in CSF as people, uh, people's age exceed 50. And so this uh, brings up the whole idea of toxicity. Kevin Robertson at UNC uh, and Jeff Liner and Rick Meeker very nicely um, uh, published on this in a highly cited article using uh, fetal rat neuronal cortical neuron uh, cultures, showing that if they increase the concentration of uh, nearly any drug, uh, antiretroviral drug, that they would have uh, killing of neurons. And, but working with Ann Bang and uh, Sandy Hinckley at the Sanford Burnham Prebys uh, Medical Research Institute in San Diego, uh, we've also found similar findings using her human neuron cultures. So uh, what else can we do? Well, there's also data on Moraviroc intensification, uh, two pilot studies finding essentially similar results that if you add Moraviroc onto uh, an existing suppressive antiretroviral regimen, that uh, you'll have neurocognitive improvement. And uh, we're now doing a study in the ACTG uh, to explore this further. And then uh, many people brought up uh, various uh, cure methods, and uh, uh, this is obviously a very lengthy uh, 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 subject of discussion as well. But there are groups who are working on uh, an, uh, uh, nanoparticles, not only to target lymphoid tissue, but to target uh, myeloid cells and also uh, uh, glial cells to try to eliminate um, uh, HIV in protected compartments like the brain. So Kamel Khalili at uh, Temple, Amada Van Nair in Miami, as well as uh, uh, Ratnesh Lal in UCSD are, are working uh, on in this area. And just as was brought up yesterday, just a cautionary note that uh, there are data supporting that when we activate uh, HIV in the brain that we can have life-threatening complications either like CNS iris uh, here in cases reported from Hopkins or CD8 T-cell encephalitis in cases reported from France. So all of this is to say that we should uh, navigate these waters carefully between uh, Scylla and Charybdis and the uh, rocky uh, sort of uh, image here reminded me of this beautiful place that we're at here as well and uh, and, uh, and again, just uh, ending to thank everyone for uh, sitting through this. We started a little late. I think I'm pretty much on time. Uh, and uh, so uh, thanking our study volunteers as well as all of my colleagues. So thank you very much.